welcome to Out of the Box Radio with me, your host, Christine Blasdale. Out of the Box Radio is a weekly podcast of audible ear candy dedicated to bringing a fresh perspective on this thing that we call life. And each and every week, we're going to be diving into the topics that matter most with lively conversations on issues such as health, wellness, and transformational healing, all with the goal of creating a better world and becoming a happier human being. I will be your tour guide for this epic adventure, and each and every week we're going to be embarking on a journey with the ultimate goal being transformation to our highest potential. And now, let's get out of the box. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Out of the Box Radio. I am your host, Christine Blasdale, and I'm very glad that you tuned in today because we have a very special program I have a very, very unique guest with me today, Anne Blakely. Anne is the founder and facilitator of Trans Alliance Ventura, the only transgender-specific support group in Ventura County. She is also the executive director of the Free To Be Me Foundation, Incorporated. And I want to welcome to Out of the Box Radio my dear friend, Anne Blakely. Welcome to Out of the Box. Thank you very much, Christine. It's really a pleasure to be here. Now, we spoke a little bit on the phone and it was actually your idea, I think, originally to mm-hmm. say, hey, you know what? I would love to be a guest on Out of the Box Radio. And when you said that, it was I had full chills. Like right now, I still have full chills. Full chills, folks, just meaning like all the hair on my arm sticks straight up, which means to me, um, it, it's, it's a sign of recognition. It's um, a big old yes from the universe is what it is. And I thought about it for a nanosecond and I was like yes I mean I hit reply really fast and I was like yes 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 and the reason why is that your journey and what you're currently working with not only the community the trans community but also the general population in, you know in in general the the the, the world out there representing in, in a positive light the journey of trans individuals, uh, male, female, whoever identify as male or female. And I think it's such an important thing right now. We see so much going on. Can you talk about your journey to where you are right now? I know it's a long journey. Yeah, it is. But but to let our listeners know why you're doing what you're doing right now, because I think it's a, it's a, a huge positive impact in the world. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for the opportunity because It came to me kind of impromptu. It was like spontaneous thought to be interviewed. This is my first radio interview ever, so I'm pretty excited about this. I did do a call-in once, and that was pretty good. It was exciting. But this one is uh, very unique because I'm sitting here with my friend, Christine, Mm -hmm. and uh, she's making me feel very comfortable. So thank you very much, Christine. My journey. Okay, when I was about three years old, I'm going to go way back then. Go back, girl, go way back. <laughs> because that's when typically we realize that we, we we get a consciousness about who we are. We determine that, you know, we, we start to realize that we're different than everybody else and we have this consciousness that comes in. So me and my brother used to play um, role play like cartoons. So Bugs Bunny cartoons and all the different things like that. And there was this cartoon show that was on back then, way back when on Channel 52, uh, old UHF station. I remember 52. It was called Kimba the White Lion. I love Kimba. I know. And I was like, I was always the female lion, the oh. little girl, you know, and I was like, and it felt good. It felt right. My brother was older than me, so he was Kimba. And, uh, you know, there was no sexual things or anything. We were just role playing the parts. And of course, cartoons did, didn't have that kind of connotation. It was just kids playing. So anyway, I, um, I loved playing the girl part and it was right and it felt great and I was like, okay, this is natural, perfect for me. But my brother later told me, he goes, you can't do that anymore because you're actually a boy. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean? And he explained to me what the difference is. So from like three and four years old, I realized that if I tried to be who I was out in the open, I would probably be ridiculed. And so I decided to hide that part of me. And looking through the old eight millimeter, um, eight millimeter film of when I was a child, I was pretty effeminate. I mean, just the way I acted and everything, it was uh, pretty effeminate, but I tried not to identify as that. And then when I was a preteen, probably about 12, I realized that I like girls. 
I don't like boys at all. I was not, I have no attraction to them. So I said, oh gosh, I can't be effeminate at all. I have to be a man. Uh. And I did everything I could to try and emulate my brother, my father, and just do what I thought men should do. What and, was that? <laughs> what okay. was that? Burping? Uh, burning? What well, no, I could never do those things in public. That was something I just couldn't do. It was, I don't know, even when I got married and with my wife, I couldn't do that around her. It was weird. <laughs> anyway, so um, I... Uh, sports? Sports, yeah, I tried sports. But the problem with that was I could not stand being in the men's locker room. Um, it was just too much for me to be around all that testosterone. So I couldn't do sports. Of course, that wasn't the reason I told my dad. I told my dad I wasn't good enough, but I was really good in football. <laughs> I could throw the football far. I think you saw me throwing it once, maybe. I don't. I don't. I. I just. I know that you. I know that you probably whatever sport you picked up, you probably could do really well at. Well, I was six foot three, and I tried out for basketball. <laughs> that's what I was gonna. That's but, what I was going towards. Like I'm like, you're not a small, tiny little thing. You're six foot three. <laughs> but I. I really. I really sucked at basketball. <laughs> You did? I did. I had no coordination when it came to dribbling. Mm -hmm. um, I just couldn't keep myself balanced, and I felt like I was falling over on people. So I didn't play basketball till later in life. Um, so anyway, as I was um, learning more about myself, I realized that I like girls, and um, I had girlfriends. I didn't have guy friends. I had girlfriends, which kind of made people think that I was gay, and I didn't like that because I'm like, I don't like boys, so why do you think that way? And so I continued to try and become more macho and stuff. I started doing Taekwondo. I started hanging around some stoners, which I didn't really care for, but I did just because. Uh, I never felt comfortable in that environment, but I did it. I hung around my brother a lot. Um, and then because I wasn't comfortable towards the latter part of my um, years in high school, I decided to become more of a loner. And um, I isolated myself from most people. Then I had this girlfriend that really liked me and I was getting teased so much that I decided I would let her de-virginize me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I felt so bad because if I felt like I was using her and, and it didn't feel right. Um, and at that time, I also saw my future wife who I instantly fell in love with. And so I broke it off with that girl before we had done it. <laughs> and then uh, I tried to get together with my future wife and uh, she had already started dating a friend of mine <laughs> but I'm not exhibiting a lot of femininity at this time I'm really trying to be more of a man still trying to fit in yeah so. trying to fit in that that persona and stuff so I uh, joined the military and uh, just before joining the military my future wife seduced me <laughs> <laughs> and so she broke it off with him and we ended up getting married. <laughs> yeah, long trying to break this down into a really no, short segment, but it, that's so what happened. So you're married and uh -huh. you're going into the military. Yes. But when when I got with my wife, um, I thought, oh, great, I'm with a woman, so therefore I won't want to be a woman. Mm -hmm. And I really thought that. I thought for sure, okay, first time ever having sex with a woman will take this away from me. Right. It didn't. Not Not for a moment. Not even a little bit. So I joined the military and uh, we were married and we're traveling all over the world and we have four kids in five years, which I'm really happy for. I mean, I fathered three, our four wonderful children. Um, through that, I have six great, no, fantastic grandchildren, not great grandchildren yet. Fantastic grandchildren. You have six I have six grandchildren. Oh my God, yeah. Anne, that's amazing. I know, it's so awesome. So I have no regrets over, over, presenting male during that time and being able to have my family and be able to raise my children and um, even even playing the role of a father and a husband. I have no regrets of that. And this is a time. When, what, what years are we talking about? Oh, we're talking this started in the mid 80s and um, my wife and I just split up in 2011. So we were married so. for 27 years. In the 80s, there were no you, you, there were no other options were there no I mean, you didn't didn't even know what was going on you i had just no like, idea oh i'm i i love women i'm 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 a father mm -hmm. uh i'm married to this woman for many years i'm i'm hoping that 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 i'm i'm okay yeah oh. 
Well, I did see the Rocky Horror Picture Show, and of course I saw the Transylvania Transvestite and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, I do not relate to that. No. I, I just didn't relate to that well at all. Well, and t- t- Talk about why. Because is because it's, of the campiness of it or the or the um the poking fun at it what is it i think it was more because it seemed like it was a sexual thing and uh. to me it wasn't sexual at all to me it wasn't about you know well i want to be a woman because i want to have vaginal sex although that is something i want but <laughs> yeah. um that wasn't the motivation behind it and and so it kind of um it kind of turned me off to those kind of things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I didn't have anything. I, I was trying my hardest not to ever dress as a woman, but I kept it in the closet. So I would find myself dressing up literally in the closet with my wife's clothes. Mm-hmm. And um, she kind of suspected, but didn't really want to know. So about four years into our marriage, um, I took her aside and I told her, I said, I dressed as a woman and I don't really understand why. I want to be married. I don't want to be with a man. I kind of think I want to be a, a man myself, but I don't really know. So um, she said, okay, well, I don't want to know anything about it. Just if you have to do it, just don't let the kids see you and don't, don't do anything about it. So for the next 15 plus years, wow. um, that's basically what I did. I was in the closet and every once in a while I'd find some clothes and dress up and felt good for a little bit and then I felt guilty afterward and thought, how can I be doing this? I'm supposed to be a man. How can I like dressing up like a woman and pretending to be one? You know, because basically that's what I thought I was doing. I thought I was pretending. But later on I realized that the pretending was being a man. Mm. That was wor- that was the role I was playing. So I... um Towards the end of our marriage, you know, um, I'm getting ready to retire out of the military. My kids are growing up, graduating from high school, and I'm feeling this urge to dress more and more and more. And my wife is feeling that and sensing it, and she's growing more and more distant. Um, This one time I decided to just take a chance, and I dressed up, came to bed, I looked good, too. (laughs) (laughs) I looked good, too. (laughs) And uh, so my wife feels the the fishnet stockings and the the lacy clothes that I'm wearing, and she says, what the hell is this? And I said, "Um, just trying to experiment a little, and she goes, get the hell out of the room. I don't want to see you. She didn't even look my way. Uh, and so I got out of the room and I'm sitting in the living room and I'm just crying and I'm like this this is wrong we're supposed to be like this this is we're supposed to be I'm supposed to be with her like this you know that's what I was thinking I don't know why it was so hard for me to think that she didn't want me this way I didn't understand it so I um I went back <laughs> I went back in the room and and I said, "Aren't you a little bit curious?" And then she started yelling, cussing, and throwing stuff at me. Oh. And oh. then I went back in the living room. I fell on the floor and I just started crying. Why is this happening? Why can't I? Why can't I get rid of this? Why does this keep coming back to me? And um, I ripped everything off. And um, my wife came out and she said, "I want a divorce." I said, please no, let, let me try and fix this. So I um, I went to a therapist. She said, okay. Um, and I went to a therapist and the therapist uh, said, well, it sounds to me like your wife has the problem that she can't accept you for who you are. Mm-hmm. I said, no, I'm the one with the problem and I want this out of me. I don't want this, I want my marriage. I wanna be a father. And um, he said, well, I can't help you said, well, if you really want to try this, then go ahead and go to a sex anonymous thing. And I had no idea what that was or why I was going, but I did go and I spilled my guts out to everybody and they're like, you're not supposed to be here. <laughs> no. It's not a sexual thing. So again, I'm left on my own to try and fix this and save my marriage. And for almost a year, I didn't 
I didn't do anything. I was fighting, struggling. I found, I did find another therapist. And then um, by this time I'm out of the military, I'm working as a civilian employee for the US government. And um, I was actually doing well and succeeding. I was up and coming leader. I was gonna be a, a supervisor. I was acting supervisor at one time. That's when I moved out here to Ventura. And that was in um, July of 2012. Now, I'm still trying not to present female at all. I'm still trying to be a man. And um, during this time that I was being accused, my wife also decided to find a man, another man. And um, that's why it was the most trying time of my life because she said that if I stay with you, I may as well be a lesbian. And I thought, my thought was, yeah, why not? And, like, that's so bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But uh, she was definitely adamant about not yeah. not being that way. So um, she, uh, you know, I understand her pain because she married a man. Right. She married somebody that she thought was a man, and I thought I was too. Well, tried to, con to be. I'd convinced myself yeah. I was, yeah. but I never felt that way. Um, so when I um, when I move out here. I'm still fighting this part of me, trying not to be a woman. And this is actually the first time I ever lived alone. When I was, I joined the military when I was 18, got married when I was 18. That's shortly out of graduating from high school. And so I raised my family. I was always living with my family, somebody. And even when my wife and I separated, I was living with my kids. So um, I never lived alone. This is the first time. So I said, okay. If I can, if I can overcome this while I'm living alone, then I can overcome anything and I won't have to be a woman and I'll be a man, live my life and everybody's going to be happy because I'm being what they want me to be. Um, my kids will be happy and maybe my ex-wife will come back to me because I'm going to be that strong man that she expects. Well, that didn't happen. <laughs> Instead, um, Halloween comes around 2012. And I'm just like, I can't fight this anymore. I don't know why, but I can't do it. So I get some Halloween costumes and some really sexy outfits. <laughs> and um, I said, you know what? I'm not fighting anymore. I'm just going to do this and see what happens. I joined a cross-dressers site on, um, uh, it's called crossdressers.com thinking that's what I was because in my mind, I wanted to be a man. I convinced myself I wanted to be a man, but I want to dress up like a woman. So it's got to be a cross-dressers thing. Nope, it's not. Nope, it's not, but I didn't know any better. So I joined this group and everything and I have to pick a name. I never picked a female name before for myself. So I just picked Anne for a couple reasons. It was similar, kind of similar to my dead name now that's what we call our former names when we mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when we transition um and uh i didn't even look it up to see what it was i did like anne frank and anne hathaway so that's why it has a n and e because i love that the, the way royal it's spelled. Anne. yeah it's the royal anne <laughs> and so i um i joined the group and i'm talking all these different cross dressers and everything and i'm feeling pretty good you know but i'm starting to feel different than them you know it's like we're men in dresses. We like to dress up. And I'm like, well, I don't really feel like a man in a dress. I feel like this is right for me. And they said, oh, that's just the pink fog. You'll get out of it. <laughs> yeah, that's what they call it. The, the pink, pink fog. The pink fog. I don't know what it means, but I guess it's a, like a euphoric feeling when a cross-dresser dresses up for right. the first few times. and when, starts when a, Someone who identifies as male uh, dresses up uh, as a female. Yes. There's the pink fog. Yes, yes. that's what they yeah. called it, the pink fog. But you weren't you weren't connecting to any of that. You no, like, I wasn't. As a matter of fact, I, I was trying to find out how am I am I tra am I transgender or am I a cross dresser? And I'm trying to ask different people. And in the cross dressers group, they said, okay, you need to go to the transsexual section because that's where the um, transgender people are. So I joined that section of the crossdressers.com, and I found out that. I do relate better with the people in this group. And they encouraged me to go outside the group to learn more about being transgender. And I did, and I, I said, oh, <laughs> oh. boing, the light's on. And it's like, <laughs> oh, there's a light over my head. And I'm like- I was just born into the wrong gender. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> exactly. All those years of, oh, 
Really? Yeah, it was it was so it was such an enlightening thing for me at relief. that point. Yeah, it was a relief. And you know, of course you're going through this thing and you're like, how's everybody going to react? How's my family going to react? What's going to happen? So I kind of decided I was going to go ahead and do the full transition, but I had to move my way into it. So by December of 2012, I told most of my children that I was going to probably transition. And they were like, okay, well, we love you, we care for you, and um, if that's something you feel like you need to do. Wow. Go ahead. Wow. <laughs> wow, but that wasn't sincere. Oh. They... they thought it was a phase because they knew I was going through depression with a divorce and all that kind of stuff. They thought it was a phase. You think it was more of a, like cross-dressing? They thought it was more like just something I was going through experimenting and things like that. They had no idea. So they encouraged me not knowing that it's like, that was the green light for me. That was like, okay, nothing's gonna stop me now. My kids are okay with this. I'm going full force. And um, within, I, I got a therapist cause I wanted to make sure that it wasn't due to any depression or anything. So I went and saw a gender therapist and I got a lot of different um, opinions and I went to see two different therapists. It's kind of amazing cause they both said the same thing in the second session. Um, both of them I saw, I saw them at two different times. Uh, in the second session, as I'm talking, they would stop me and say, okay, I'm convinced you're a woman. And they both said the exact same words in the second session when I was meeting them, which was another uh, affirmation. So I decided I was gonna transition and the next step is to remove facial hair, start hormone Hormones, therapy, right. yeah, things like that. And the problem was, and this is one of the reasons why I started this group in Ventura, because there is no transgender care in Ventura. There was none. There was nobody that you can go to for medical care and say, what do I need to do? Really? There was no therapist that you can go to in Ventura that says, what do I need to do? There was nobody, nothing. There was no support groups, there was nothing. So I learned a lot of this by meeting a couple other transgender people and getting to know them and stuff. And of course they did it on their own. They didn't have the proper therapy and stuff. And I found out all about the WPATH. It's the World Professional Association of Transgender Health. And I did a lot of self-study to determine what is required. There's a standards of care in there for behavioral health, mental health, and also for uh, transition, including uh, physical transition with hormones and surgeries. It took me six months to get a therapist, or not a therapist, to get an endocrinologist because they're the ones that prescribe the hormones. Right. I couldn't wait that long. Um, so I went to my primary care provider and I said, I'm going to start my own hormones. And he said, well, I can't tell you yes, I can't tell you no, because it's something you're going to do. I'm not going to prescribe them, but I will monitor your blood. I make sure that your organs and everything are, will set a baseline and we'll start doing that. So I did. And I bought my hormone replacement on my own and um, started taking the pills and injecting and I felt good. It's kind of weird but at first, but felt right. Mm. <laughs> now, the, now the issue is work. Oh, bugger. <laughs> um, Those people. Yes. <laughs> I have to come out to work. How do I do that? And you're working at that time too, not in a necessarily transgender friendly environment. Right. Um, I was working as a civilian employee federal in the federal government. Um, and um, I wasn't sure how that would happen, how that would go about. So I figured, well, I don't know a lot of transgender people in the federal government, so I can only assume that there's not a policy in place. So again, I do my research. I found out the Office of Pri Personal Management has guidance on how to deal with transgender people. And the guidance specifically tells us, tells uh, management that they cannot discriminate against anybody whose gender expression is, or gender identification is different than what their gender is on their identification or birth certificate or anything. So um, I used that and I took it to my boss and I said, I'm gonna transition. And he says, well, um, we need to make sure that the employees are good with this. And I'm like, well, I'm doing this out of courtesy. Yes, I do agree with that because I don't want anybody else to feel threatened by me or anything. So I want them to be educated before I transition. I didn't have to because I had the OPM guidance right there right. and um, I didn't have to do that, but I chose to do it anyway. 
And so we had diversity training um, and I wasn't there because they wanted to tell them that the next time they see me, I wouldn't be my former self, I would be Anne. Anne. <laughs> and from what I understand, that went pretty good and most of the people were fairly accepting. They even kind of joked around and said, is she gonna be pretty? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was only one person that saw me before at work as Anne, and she didn't say anything. <laughs> I, my first day at work was kind of, it was event free, actually. Um, I was the one that was super nervous, and I came to work. I did my job the best I could. Next thing you know, I'm coming to work every day, and I'm getting more and more comfortable with myself and people around me. And uh, the bathroom issue was a slight issue also because there was one person out of the entire organization that I knew would have a problem with it. So instead of causing problems, causing waves, I chose to use a bathroom that was not frequented by other women. Hmm. It was a women's restroom, but it was not frequented by other women. And um, six months into that, I said, you know what, I'm not gonna do this anymore. So I went to that one person and I said, you've seen me for six months now, would you be uncomfortable with me being in the women's restroom? She looks at me and she goes, no, I think it'll be okay. Didn't have a problem with that ever since. You're just going to pee pee. I know, but <laughs> I knew she would be uncomfortable. So out of respect for her, I chose to, you're it was kind. my choice. You're a very kind person. It was, it was my choice. And I also used that as an education opportunity because this That's, person. Yes, yeah. that's what I love about you. And, uh, and folks, if you're just tuning in, this is Out of the Box Radio, and my guest is the wonderful Anne Blakely, a, a founder and facilitator of Trans Alliance Ventura, the only transgender-specific support group here in Ventura County. She is also the executive director of the Free to Be Me Foundation Incorporated. And you had just mentioned, and I, and I wanted to stop you just for a second because you had mentioned the issue about the, the, bath, the restroom. And right now... I mean, my goodness, what's happening in states, in a few states across the, the country, is this extreme uh, push towards what, like monitoring bathrooms now, and 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 you can you can have somebody like spy on people, and and yeah, and what you get arrested if you if you're in a state and you use if you use a restroom that is from your uh, birth, birth certificate, yeah. if you don't use the restroom that is assigned to that, then what, you can go to jail? Or fined, yes. Or fined. Yes. Um, wow. They, they call them bathroom bills, but they're not bathroom bills. They're discrimination bills. They're discrimination laws. Because basically what that is, is they're targeting transgender people. And anytime you target a specific group, that is a discrimination towards that group. We're being targeted out of fear because they don't understand us. They don't feel like they can um, relate with us. They feel like we're some type of a... Um, a freak or a fetish or something that is perverted. not perverted and stuff not understanding what gender really is gender has nothing to do with your physical sex it really does have to do with your brain chemistry and your brain wiring um, that's how you feel as a certain gender um, and genders are variant we've built a society our fluid. yeah it's very fluid We've built a society in a binary system. In other words, that we have male and female, and there's nothing in between. However, other societies around the world have multiple genders that they've identified. The Samoan culture and most Polynesian cultures have a third gender, which is somebody who would be identified at birth. They may have male genitalia, but they also are, assen are given uh, an assignment as being a, a woman. And that is something that the parents provide them. If they have too many boys in the family, they will assign somebody a woman. And then that child is raised as a girl. But when they reach a certain age, they, are, they can choose whether or not they want to be a boy or girl. Wow. And a lot of them do choose to stay as female. And they're accepted in that culture as a woman. They get married, they have sex, they do all those things just as a woman. Um, and it's fully accepted. In the um, ancient... American Indian tribes, a lot of them had what they called two spirits, mm, yeah. which was somebody that was um, maybe born in a specific sex, a physical sex, but their gender, how they express themselves, um, was different than that physical sex. And they were not looked down upon. They were, as a matter of fact, a lot of times they were considered like a shaman or, or a spiritual uh, advisor and such called true spirits. Yes, they were revered. 
there's a lot of things out there that our culture has deemed as evil that other cultures accept as not bad at all. As a matter of fact, they revere a lot of it. So to change that is very difficult in any culture. Whenever you have something that's going through change, um, you get a lot of pushback. And that's what's happening with these discrimination laws. Just like when the 60s, when um, we started having civil rights movements and stuff, because even though we had the Emancipation Proclamation in the mid 1800s, many blacks were still not free. They were treated as less than human. They weren't able to vote. Yep. Uh, interracial marriage was, interracial marriage only became legal just not, I mean, not very long ago. No, no. So it was like in the 70s, I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, and so with the, the passing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, that created a lot of pushback. And there was a lot of people that are saying, no, we're not changing because this has been our culture for such a long time. And that's what's happening now. The same thing is happening. And so they're using fear to establish their um, agenda. And that fear is saying that, well, a man can go into a women's restroom dressed like a woman and therefore cause some kind of problems Therefore, we shouldn't allow our transgender people in the bathroom, period, because that will open the door for these men. We, we believe that transgender people aren't the problem, but it'll open the door for these men. You know what? That's a farce because those men could do that now. I mean, they already are. Yeah. It's not changing anything. It's just creating more fear, saying that if I allow a transgender person to come in here, I may be allowing a man to come in here and spy on my child or molest my child or something. Listen, that's been going on for years. There's been um, molestation of men in uh, boys in men's restrooms. There's been molestation of girls the, in girls' restrooms. And the and the and the majority of, of of individuals who are found to be molesting children, the 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 characteristic is straight white male. Yes, they identify who identify as male, heterosexual yes. mm-hmm. male. Just for the record. And the other thing is there not there's not a single not a single reported case of a transgender person doing any of that. Ugh. Not one in the United States or any other country that I know of. It's not reported anywhere. So why are these laws so necessary? They're not F- hate fear? Yes. Um so that's the main thing with Yes, scapegoating and that's the main reason why we're having to fight these discrimination laws. You know this year, or I think maybe it was just last year, uh, I attended um, a really moving ceremony on the steps of City Hall. Oh, yeah. It was the Transgender Day of Remembrance. Yes. And I don't think that our listeners are quite aware of, you know, maybe depending upon where they live, if they live in, you know, a bigger city like New York or Los Angeles, maybe, maybe they don't hear about it as much, but we've lost a lot of individuals to, uh, to violent uh, crime, yes, to, to being beaten and, and murdered, but also suicides because uh, trying to fit into a world that mm-hmm. doesn't want to accept them and ha- having that, I guess, be the only option. But can you talk about the Transgender Day of Remembrance and what that uh, means to you? Because I know I was very moving to me, and when he saw all of the photos of the people that were lost just in that I think it was just in that year. Just in that 12-month period. 12-month period. Yeah. Talk about that. Um, the Transgender Day of Remembrance started in, um, I believe it was 1998. Um, it was by a parent who lost their child because, due to violence. And she um, worked up, worked with uh, PFLAG to set it up. And, and um, it's become a international event now because there's so many transgender people. Something about the transgender demographic is that we are the smallest population known. I'm, when it comes to just being transgender alone, we're less than 1% of the population. You think that it's really a lot more now because we're coming out and you're seeing more of us, but we've been around for a very, very long time. It's just that because we've been scrutinized so harshly and we've been uh, subject to so much discrimination, we've chosen to live in what we call stealth mode, which means that we don't, we've not been out. Once we get to the certain point to where we're presenting in the gender that we identify and we're presenting well in the binary system, uh, male or female, we go into secrecy. Nobody knows that we're transgender. We don't tell anybody. That's what stealth mode means. Because it's dangerous? It's dangerous. So for years and years, that's what's been happening. Very few people have been in this public eye, you know, spotlight, 
claiming to be transgender. Most people would go into hiding, change their life, get rid of their family, wow. change their whole career, all that kind of stuff would happen after they have transitioned. So now we're, we're becoming more public. Thank you to um, Caitlyn Jenner and Laverne Cox, uh, Janet Mock. All those people are bringing positive visibility to the transgender community, which is awesome. But at the same time, we're getting that pushback because so many people don't want to understand us. And that is creating a lot of division in our culture because it's, it's questioning the binary system that's been developed in our society for so long. And with that said, you know, it's an education. The only way to change this is through positive exposure and education. And that's basically what my motto has been since we've been uh, starting this uh, transgender thing in, here in Ventura County. So the Transgender Day of Remembrance is to signify those people that have lost their lives over the past 12 months. And it's on November 20th of every year. And what we did this last year in 2015 is we... Um, for the first time ever, we had such a big event, and thank you to Diversity Collective Ventura County, they were a big part in uh, helping us pull this together, that we had such a big event. It was at City Hall, and um, we used a lot of different things to try and promote education and awareness in a positive way. We used skits, um, we had some skits talking about how people have problems with us going into bathrooms and how it can turn to violence many times. Um, we had a video that we showed. It was called The Valentine Road. Oh, yeah. And that was very moving. It caused a lot of emotional pain. A lot of people ended up, we had counselors ready, the therapists ready, and we did have several people that had to be counseled while there because this incident in 2009 happened here in Ventura County in Oxnard to where a young transgender person, Larry King, um, who was a, known to few as Letitia King, but she did identify as Letitia King during the last week of her life, um, was shot and killed by a fellow student at school because of um, transphobia. And um, it became a big issue here in Ventura County and it's we're still healing from that. And there's still a lot of division there. Some people blame Letitia for it. Some people blame um, Brandon for it. Brandon McKinney was his name, I think, um, is the one that shot Letitia. So we used that video to kind of highlight that the problem with showing discrimination towards transgender people, how easily it can turn to violence, and that transgender people need to have positive allies to support us. And um, we're starting to get that. And without the allies, just as in the... 1960s without white people marching with black people, without cisgender allies marching with us, um, we probably won't succeed. So we need much more allies. And by the way, what cisgender means is um, cis, the term C-I-S means same. Um, and what that means is that your, your, your gender, your, how you think yourself is the same as your physical gender, your physical sex. So that's why we call it cisgender. Transgender means on the other side of. So that's what the word trans means. It means like going from one place to go to the other side of. And so transgender basically means you're going from the, the gender that you are identified at birth to the gender you feel. Something I want to talk about a little bit more is... Um, the variations in gender. I really yeah, want to talk yeah, about that. Yeah, I, I want you because uh, because the whole thing is that you know is challenging this whole binary belief, you know, uh, dogma of you know you're it's either you're male or female. What for for me, and this is only just personally me, and I know a few people that that are that are along the same lines. I don't know if I would because I hate labels. I do. Mm. I hate being labeled. But I I feel that I'm more gender fluid, meaning that. You know, I I have masculine qualities that I love and I embrace, and I have feminine qualities that I love and embrace. I will. I'm still Christine. I don't. I don't have a thing where I'm like, no, call me Chris. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to be me, but at the same time, I know that I have I have a, um, a layering. Yeah. Of of different ones of different types of of me. You know, yeah. different variations of me, and I think that. Just challenging that whole notion of it's either black or white, male or female. Mm -hmm. That alone is so threatening to some people. 
it's you, getting better, but it's only getting better through dialogue. And yes. like, and that's why you know having you on out of the box radio. Yes, people in Los Angeles and Ventura are going to hear it, but mm -hmm. people in Kansas are going to hear it. You know, people in in uh, Nebraska. With the with boys don't cry that the movie was on uh, I think it was in Nebraska. I think you're right. Yeah, I mean brutally. Yes, brutally uh, raped and murdered um, because she you know she was identifying as as a as a boy. Yeah. she really was a boy, and uh, that that move that that story. I mean I saw it as a movie, but the, the but the, the story when I when I realized that it was true. My heart, I I don't think I've, wow, just even thinking about it right now, I think I cried for uh, two days straight. Yeah, it was. The brutality, mm -hmm. the brutality, it reminded me of what, what, what people used to do to slaves, you know? Yeah. Just thinking of them as nothing, not even human, treating them as not even a human being. Um, that, that was what I had, uh, it just completely changed me. It's like they think that um, if somebody's different, they're not human and they deserve to be punished. They deserve to be hurt. They deserve to die for whatever reason. It hurts. It's so sad that people think that way. So how can we change the people's thoughts? Well, as long as we continue to, um, as long as we continue to have this dialogue in a positive way and not make accusations to those people that are against us, but to talk about them and try and educate them, but not to sit there and accuse them of being bigots and stuff, even though they are, but to sit there and, and fight them in, with or their fear. Yes. Or yeah. With the same fear that they have against us. If we're fighting fear with fear, it just creates more fear. Bingo. So the best thing that we can do is show love, compassion, and understanding, even when those people don't show the same to us. And educate. And educate. So the one thing I want to talk about the non-binaries um, is I identify very binary. When I was going through my transition um, and I was dressed as male, I was presenting as male as I could be. I, I didn't want anybody to think there was anything effeminate about me because I didn't, I felt like it was inappropriate. I felt like it would cause people to draw attention to me. That was my feelings and that's what I chose to do. And when I presented female, this is when I'm going through transition, when I presented female, again, there was nothing male about me. I presented female, I was more comfortable that way and I wouldn't let any masculinity come out in me. And to me, that was comfortable. Partly because I did fear, but it just felt comfortable. It felt right to me. However, um, it became more and more difficult for me to present male, period. And um, that's why I, I transitioned really fast. Within six months of realization to full-time Anne was phenomenal for most transgender people. Anyway, but I do identify as a binary woman. I don't identify gender fluid. I don't identify non-binary. Um, I identify as a woman. I thought it was out of ignorance, my own ignorance, not understanding the non-binary system or the way people think in a non-binary way. I thought that it was inappropriate for people to, sh to display something in between, even when they're going through transition. Um, I thought it made negative connotations on the transgender community. And I had validation with that thought because several people told me, cisgender people, while I'm going through my transition, they said, you're doing it right. Not like those people that are kind of in between and we don't know if they're male or female. <laughs> yeah, I literally got within that. The, yeah, within the community itself too. Within the cis community and the trans community. It was amazing. Well, I decided to learn more about um, the non-binary gender spectrum. Um, so I went to um, Trans Pride LA 2015 and um, Sandy Stone and um, Kate Bornstein were there presenting. Now Kate Bornstein and both Sandy Stone are some of the pioneers in the transgender community. And um, the thing about both of them is they did transition and they did present strongly female for a while, but then they started feeling more gender fluid. And so 
the their binary is not as defined as it is for most of us that are do feel binary. And so I did. I learned a lot from them and I learned that being non-binary is actually a good thing that it it opens your horizons that it's act, it's really a spectacular to know somebody who's non-binary because to be able to go from gender to gender to be fluid about it and be comfortable about it i was not comfortable and it, it's just really amazing to me for that i actually wished i could have been like that because it would have made it less stressful on me going through my transition um but knowing more and more non-binary people has really enlightened me to the fight that they have is much more severe than the binary transgender people. You don't see anybody that identifies non-binary in the public eye right now. It just doesn't happen very much. What I want to see is I just want to see people just be themselves. Exactly. And not even have to come out or anything like that. Like one of the reasons, you know, I have friends, one of the reasons why even on out of the box radio, the promo pictures, I, I have the beard. It's not a real beard. It's just a, it's a fake beard. But one of the reasons why I do that is be is because, and it says, you know, out of the box radio with Christine. And I have friends, uh, you know, past guests who say, Christine, um, a friend of mine saw the promotion for the show and they're all excited that I'm going to be on out of the box radio. But they're like, um, what's up with Christine and the beer? <laughs> and they do, and, and the beautiful answer is just, that's Christine. Yeah. And she go and she says, but she looks hot in a beard, doesn't she? And they're like, <laughs> yep. And they're like, okay, but isn't that strange? Also, because this this is what gets me. If you look hot or attractive or beautiful, it seems like everybody's a little bit more accepting. And I'm like, why does it have to even be that? Why yeah. can't you just be yourself, your goofy self, your you know you, who you are? Exactly. If you're heavy, if you're if you're mm -hmm. older, if but balding, that, or if you have lots of hair but, all over, but, you know, whatever. But isn't that isn't that interesting? How it, it is so interesting because our culture has deemed acceptable appearances and non-acceptable yeah. appearances. We um, beauty is something that we look aesthetically. You know, we see something on the outside, but beauty is more than that. It's more of a character. It's somebody inside and beauty can fade over the years. Beauty can fade a short time because somebody might have a lot of bitterness and they let beauty wrinkles. Beauty is all on the inside. For it me, is. it's all on the inside because I've met a lot of people that look pretty on the package on the outside is pretty, pretty packaging, but my goodness, it, their heart is dark is, and ugly, is ugly or cold or petty. Yeah. So I have a lot of um, people that identify as agender. They, they, they will identify as a transmasculine agender person. Let me describe that a little bit. Yes, please, for the listeners who are like, I just lost myself on the map. <laughs> Somebody who is identifying as transmasculine means that they identify towards the masculine spectrum of the binary system. Okay, so you have female, you have masculine. Femininity, ma masculinity. So somebody who identifies as transmasculine leans on the masculine side of the gender spectrum. However, they don't feel like a man and using male pronouns may not be appropriate with this person, even though they are growing a beard or have body hair and um, feel very comfortable with that but because they don't feel comfortable saying I'm a man, they don't have that gender binary feeling, they're very comfortable considering themselves agender, which basically means I'm neither male nor female, but I do lean towards the masculine spectrum. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> I still like my little lady bits. <laughs> I like my lady bits, but I like my beard. There you go. Yeah. And then there's, there's so many variations in the gender spectrum. It's like, um, it's like, isn't the Kinsey, the, is it, was it the Kinsey scale? This, this, the sexual, there was, I yes. mean, there's so many, and we're still trying to put, uh, what is it? Square pegs in circular holes. We're still trying to say, no, it's either this or that. Exactly. And that's the problem. So what we, okay, this is one of the things I tell kids in our group. And I say kids because we're all kids at, in heart. And you have young, you, and you also have young, young people. Too oh, we do. Well. Yeah, we do. Teen. So when somebody puts a label on you 
That's their label, not yours. Boom. You can pull that thing right off if you want. You can just visualize yourself as somebody that's Teflon and just say, nope, that's not going to stick with me. Because that's not how you identify yourself. You identify yourself, everybody is unique. And how you identify yourself is your choice, not what everybody else decides. And if you allow people to decide who you are, then what happens is your self-esteem will be lowered. You can't succeed in life. You don't have the, the desire to move. You fall into the depression. So we've got to get to the point to where no matter who tries to stick a label on us, it doesn't matter if they're a doctor, your parents, your friends, government, government, the label you put affixed to yourself is the only one that should stick. And if you choose to put no label, that is totally fine. Labels are not defining people. We define our, ourselves. So I just want to encourage everyone, no matter if you're transgender, cisgender, those are labels. But if you don't feel like those labels are fit you, you don't have to accept them just because we call you those things. You can be whatever you want. If you want to call yourself, I'm, I'm rainbow fluid, you know, and you're just multiple spectrum fluid. Doesn't matter. Just be who you are. And I so much admire the people that can go out and, and just have all this um, really colory hair, all different things, and can paint their face different colors and have all kinds of tattoos of really beautiful artwork and stuff. I love that, but that's not me. I can love somebody for being them, even though I'm nothing like that. And I love to be able to accept people, even though they're completely different than me. And I hope that that's the same people will feel about me, that they can love me for who I am, not because I conform to anything that they want me to be. Mm. Oh, I love you, Anne Blakely. Mm. <laughs> we only have a couple minutes left and I wanted to let you uh, let our listeners know if if you can tell them because again th this is going out to the nation and and into other countries as well but are there groups that uh can provide support for individuals who are perhaps in the process of transitioning or are having troubles you know support are there national groups that they can get in touch with and then, and then, of course, you can talk about locally here, but what about on the national level? Well, there's not a lot of stuff on the national level. I mean, there are some things that you can go to. Um, they have like the trans hotline, which is if you somebody who's transgender and they feel like they're going to harm themselves or something they're in desperate need, you can call the transgender hotline. Uh, it's called TransLine. Okay, just so you know, Trans Lifeline is a nonprofit dedicated to the well-being of transgender people. It's a uh, hotline staffed by transgender people for transgender people. And the hotline number is 877-565-8860. Again, in the United States, it's 877-565-8860. And I also have a, a, a number here for Canada. So if you're in, in Canada, it's 877-330-6366. There we go. You, you have GLAD, which is really doing a lot more to help the transgender community. You have, uh, you also have the National Center for Transgender Equality, NCTE, transequality.org. Uh, they do have a very small staff, but they fight very hard for us. During the battle for the uh, bathroom bill in uh, North Carolina, um, the founder, Mara Kelsing, she was actually arrested because she was going into the bathroom that I, she identifies with, but the one that doesn't identify her with her birth certificate. So civil disobedience right there. She was uh, willing to fight for us, and we really appreciate her. She was arrested for peeing. <laughs> Basically, yeah. My God. I am so glad that, that you joined me on Out of the Box Radio. Any final, final words to our, to our audience before we, we take off? Yeah, I'd like to um, talk about what we're doing with the Trans Alliance Ventura. We're doing a lot of things locally to try and educate the um, local community. I've, I've done a lot to speak directly to businesses about how to deal with somebody that may not be identifying, may not be um, openly identifying as a specific binary gender, but they're in the restroom. How do you deal with that? And I've, I've been educating them on different 
things to do. We had the first uh, Transgender Day of Visibility, which was in Thousand Oaks on March 31st. We've done a lot of things to promote us in that sense. But our, our main thing is that we are here to support the transgender community. We've got support groups for transgender, gender non-binary. We meet once a week for those. We also started meeting for family topics. In other words, transgender people that have issues with their family or their family wants to come and learn more about their family member. Most of us are like this. When we have our family members start to do things that go outside of our expectations, we suddenly feel barriers go up between us. And what we want to try and do is remove those barriers with family members. The other thing that we're starting is the um, transgender allies. It's called transgender relationships. So those that want to have some kind of a relationship or have a relationship with a transgender person, it doesn't have, not family members, we're talking about significant others, we're talking about friends, and we're talking about allies. If it, any of those meet those, anyone meets those criteria and they want to come to our meetings um, or any of our meetings want to learn more about it, you can contact me at uh, 805-330-1304. And um, again, that's 805 805- 330-1304. And that's any issues that you have. Um, if I don't pick up, then I will get back with you, leave a message. It, I do accept text messages also. Or you can send an email to Trans Alliance Ventura, all one word, Trans Alliance Ventura at gmail.com. You're going to get a lot of phone calls, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> and emails. I already get a lot. You're going to get more. You're <laughs> going to get more. And and I'm going to just put this out there too. If you're a family member and there's someone in your family, a child, a brother, a mother, whoever, who is transitioning or is is, is questioning, is their, questioning gender. Their, their gender or is gay or lesbian or whatever, you know what? Love is love is love. And so it, it, if you're, especially if you're the parent, you know, just think about the fact that when that baby came out and you first saw it, you really didn't care if it was a boy or a girl. You were just so damn happy that it was your baby, right? And so, so just uh, uh, realize that that yeah. that we all need and desire love, and that's all that matters. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter what the packaging is. It doesn't matter what it's wrapped in. Is that love? So I just want to end on that note. Thank you so much. My guest today has been Anne. Blakely, founder and facilitator of Trans Alliance Ventura. Again, the only transgender specific support group here in Ventura County. For more information, you can go to free to be me, and that's free to the number two, free to number two, free to be me foundation.org, or you can also go to transallianceventura.tumblr.com. Anne Blakely, thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Christine. It's been a privilege. Mwah! I love you. Mwah! <laughs> and join us next week for another edition of Out of the Box Radio. And as always, remember to think outside of the box. Bye.